Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. Welcome to Quick Med, where medicine is explained quickly and easily. Today we will be discussing rabies and tetanus prophylaxis, so let's get to it. All right, so let's start off with rabies and give an overview. Rabies is an RNA virus that affects the central nervous system. It does this by replicating in the muscle and binds to nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in the muscle with retrograde migration to the CNS. That's how it gets to the CNS. It's able to affect any warm-blooded animal, and it's almost always fatal as there is no cure for rabies. It is transmitted through the saliva of an infected animal, often through an animal bite. This is how it actually gets into the muscles. And in the United States, the most common rabies carriers are bats, raccoons, and skunks. It more commonly occurs in children and in Asia and Africa. In the United States, the cases are very, very rare here, mainly because of prophylaxis. Interestingly, we cannot test for rabies in a live animal. The only way to do this is through examination of brain tissue of a dead animal. So considering this, with each animal bite, you have to decide whether or not to quarantine the animal, which we'll discuss in a future slide, or sacrifice and test the animal for rabies, or just recommend that the victim get treated for rabies regardless. Now let's talk about rabies prophylaxis. We assume bats, raccoons, skunks, foxes, dogs, cats, and ferrets are rabid. I put an asterisk here because dogs, cats, and ferrets can also be domesticated animals, and domesticated animals are typically vaccinated against rabies, and so those situations would really need to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis. Animal bites, in which you would consider more on an individual basis, also include rodents like rats and mice, rabbits and squirrels, as these animals are less likely to transmit rabies. Alright, so previously we mentioned quarantining an animal, so what does that actually mean? So there is such a thing as a 10-day quarantine. So this involves monitoring an animal that has bitten a human for 10 days for any signs of rabies. These signs include any behavioral changes like aggressiveness, hypersensitivity to light and sound or seizures, and eventually paralysis with eventual respiratory failure and death. Obviously, this can only be done for animals that have been captured or can be monitored like a domesticated animal. And the reason why we do a 10-day quarantine is because an infected animal can only transmit rabies after clinical signs have developed. Once those signs have developed, the animal will eventually die within 5 to 10 days. So if an animal is able to survive that 10-day period of monitoring, then it's very unlikely that that animal has rabies. But let's say you're in a situation where you need to give a patient rabies prophylaxis. How is that done? It's done through immune globulin, which is given intramuscularly and is usually thoroughly infiltrated in the area around and into the wound. The patient must also receive a rabies vaccine, which is actually a series of vaccines. So they get a vaccine on day zero day 3, day 7, and then day 14 in order to complete the full series. Let's now switch over to tetanus. As with rabies, tetanus is a nervous system disorder caused by Clostridium tetani, and this is often found in the soil. It is a toxin-producing bacteria which actually produces a toxin that binds to receptors on the presynaptic membranes of peripheral motor neurons. This allows for retrograde migration to the CNS as we had seen before. The toxin then prevents release of inhibitory neurotransmitters, which results in increased activation of motor nerves. So as you can imagine, this would result in increased muscle spasms, which is what we see with tetanus. More than 80% of patients will present with trismus or lockjaw, which leads to this characteristic smile often known as rhesus sardonicus. And unfortunately, the most severe form of tetanus is often the most common form that presents, and this is generalized tetanus. This is where you can have epistotonus, which is this characteristic posturing of patients experiencing intense muscle spasms that are often very painful. Patients will arch their back, flex and abduct the arms, and extend the legs. Muscles also involved with respiration can become impaired, leading to apnea during these episodes. So let's say you have a patient who came in after stepping on a rusty nail or having an injury where you would be concerned about tetanus exposure. You would need to consider whether or not this patient needs tetanus prophylaxis depending on a few factors. First, we need to determine how many doses of tetanus toxoid vaccine that person has received previously. And then we also need to separate the wound into a clean wound or a dirty wound. A dirty wound is often defined as a wound contaminated with dirt, feces, soil, or saliva. It also includes puncture wounds, which will often be presented as a patient who steps on a rusty nail or wounds resulting from crushing, burns, or frostbite. And then basically all other wounds would be characterized as a clean wound. So let's say you have a patient presenting with a clean wound. If this patient had received less than three vaccines, or it's unknown how many vaccines that patient had received, then this patient would receive the tetanus toxoid vaccine at that visit. If they had received at least three vaccines total in the past, 
then they would receive the vaccine only if that last vaccine was given 10 or more years ago. And in terms of immune globulin here, it's pretty easy because with any clean wound, patients will not receive immune globulin regardless of how many doses they had received. So we'll just cross these off here. Now the situation is a little bit different with a dirty wound. If this patient had received less than three doses or it's currently unknown, that patient would receive both the vaccine and immune globulin. This is actually the only situation in which a patient will receive immune globulin. If the patient had received at least three doses, then they would receive the vaccine only if the last dose was given five or more years ago. But otherwise, they do not receive immune globulin. Now, in terms of the tetanus vaccines, what are we talking about exactly? So, at two, four, and six months of age, babies will receive the DTaP vaccine, which is diphtheria, tetanus, and pertussis. They will also receive the booster dose at 15 to 18 months, and then at four to six years. The Tdap vaccine, which covers the same diseases as the Dtap, but is just a different variation of that vaccine, is given at 11 to 12 years. And then from there, every 10 years, patients will receive the TD vaccine. So as you can see here, as long as the patient was fully vaccinated as a child, it's very unlikely that you will find a patient who did not receive at least three doses of the tetanus vaccine at some point in their life. All right, so as we usually do, let's end with a practice question. Here we have a 56-year-old farmer who comes to the clinic with an injury to the foot. He states he accidentally stepped on a rusty nail while working in his farm. So here we already have a puncture wound, which would be a dirty wound. The nail penetrated deep into his foot. Physical examination reveals a penetrating wound in the sole of the left foot with no foreign particle. He tells you he had three doses of tetanus toxoid injections when he was young. His last tetanus injection was six years ago for a similar reason. So here now we know that this is a dirty wound and we're also getting information on how many vaccine doses that patient had received, which we know the patient had received three and the last injection was about six years ago. So now we're being asked what is the most appropriate next step in management. So we have all the information that we need to answer this question. This patient has a dirty wound, has received at least three doses, and the last injection was six years ago. Given that it was five or more years ago since the last dose was given, this patient would receive a tetanus toxoid booster injection. And so the answer choice here is A. B is incorrect because we would not give human immunoglobulin here. And C is also incorrect for the same reason. Choice D would be incorrect because the patient does need a vaccine booster. And choice E is kind of thrown in randomly here, but this is typically done with more chronic wounds like in chronic osteomyelitis or like in necrotizing fasciitis where surgical debridement is warranted. All right, everyone, I hope you found this helpful. I remember always forgetting tetanus prophylaxis and when to give what, and I hope that this made things a little bit clearer. If you did find this helpful, please make sure to like and subscribe because it just helps us continue doing what we're doing. And as always, everyone, good luck studying.